Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time in the UK. I've transited through Heathrow many a time, but never got outside. So, uh, thanks for inviting me, uh, John. So, what I'm going to try to do here today is to uh, be an evangelist and uh, be whimsical and uh, um, try to get you to stretch your, out of your normal confines. So, in starting off here, I want to say a few things. This is going to be a talk about wireless technology, but also about the history of technology in a way and why we end up doing sort of the things that we do. So it's not just going to be a wireless talk, I'll tell you that. But anyway, <laughs> um, you all use wireless, you know, um, television sets, cell phones, whatever. But you know what? <sighs> hardly any of you, or I could say probably any, nobody really knows how it works. It's the closest thing we have today to magic. Okay, think about that. A uh, famous science fiction writer, Arthur C. Clarke, had, uh, has a number of laws, the most famous of which is his third law, which goes, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I'll repeat that. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So again, wireless is the closest thing we've got today to a technology that is hand in hand with magic because we, we all pretty much use it, but even practitioners in the field don't know exactly how it works, okay? So, keep that in mind as we proceed. So what I wanna do is to take you back to the thrilling days of yesteryear, because what I try to do is frame my thoughts a bit. So, let's go back to the uh, start of the 19th century, where uh, the fastest way man could communicate was the fastest horse or the fastest wind-driven ship across the oceans. Okay? Something happened about the 1830s that changed that. But before I dive into that, let's, I'm going to put out my first premise, which is first comes the technology, and as time passes, it becomes more accessible. Okay? And a lot of that accessibility is driven by the economics associated with the technology. So, that big event was the telegraph in the 1830s. Now, think about that. We went from foot speed to light speed, okay? Now, the society at that time, if you go back and read the um, historical writings at that time, there's a great book called The Victorian Internet by a historian by the name of Tom Standish that delves into this. It's a quick read. I highly encourage you to pick it up. But we've had it easy because we were born dealing with light speed, okay? But back in the 19th century there, they had to make that transition from those very slow speeds to light speed, okay? And that technology wasn't very accessible at the time, but the accessibility grew over the course of the century, okay? But it changed everything. So like I said, we've had it easy in that if we think that we've had to adjust to the internet, which because the commercial internet hasn't really been here for 10 years because NSFnet NSF closed down in 1995. So here we are in 2004, not 10 years into the commercial internet. And I talk to people today and it's hard for them to remember when there was a WWW something. Okay? And it's scary. But foot speed to light speed. So here's an early wirehead. <laughs> and so we went through the 19th century and got to the end of it. And this guy Marconi, and I'm just singling him out as a, as a guy that builds stuff. Okay? Um, Sent a signal across the Atlantic in 1901. So there was a particular fast uptake in that technology, wireless technology, in that he started commercial service in 1903. So last year was the 100th anniversary of Marconi instituting commercial service. Okay? So look how far wireless has come in a century. Who would have thought? Okay? So, if you look at the early wireless heads, you know, uh, it wasn't very long after 1903 that you had a lot of the ships at sea equipped with wireless apparatus. A tremendous uptake in that technology, all right? And that was driven by the economics. At that time, the spectrum was treated as an open common. There was no regulatory bodies. People just, you know, these spark gap transmitters, that were, they were wideband uh, modulation. They transmitted all over the radio spectrum, pretty much. Okay. But 
that changed with the Titanic disaster in 1912. So what happened was interference became an issue for access to the spectrum. Um, actually, I think that the, the disaster, the Titanic disaster, served as a sort of a way for people, the governments and other people that wanted to get control of this new technology to get in there and do that. So um, various governments around the world started regulating uh, wireless devices, and my country, the FCC, came into existence in 1934. And from that point on, Spectrum was locked into a property model. Okay, and it remains that way pretty much today. So, here we are today. And I want to take a segue into something called amateur radio. You have that here. Uh, I think it's called amateur radio. Um, because what I want you to do is think about wireless, because as I started out this talk, I said it's like magic. So, where do you go to learn about magic or see it demonstrated? You go to the practitioners of the, you know, like a magician. Okay? Well, Amateur radio people are sort of the magicians of wireless, okay? And that, if you look at, uh, you know, I, I've been a ham since I was 12 years old. And this is a Russian ham shack, but in my home, back in the States, I had something like this, and that would drive my parents crazy, you know, calling CQDX, CQDX, you know, when I was 12. So, but ham radio gets around a lot. You see it showing up places like the North Pole, in space, okay? And uh, all ages, here's a young ham handling emergency traffic during the blackout last year in the U.S. I'm being facetious, but... <laughs> um, but if you look at the amateur radio service uh, as a research metaphor, what I'm going to get across to you here is that, again, you all are using wireless in some way, and you're uh, buying commercial devices, Wi-Fi devices and stuff, but you're running into problems with it. They don't work like you think they should work. To give an example, the FCC's provided internet coverage uh, last year in its building. And Vince Cerf, you've heard of Vince Cerf, the, one of the fathers of the internet, okay? He's a member of the Technological Advisory Council, of which I'm a member, and we had a meeting last Friday. And we were all sitting there sucking Wi-Fi in the commission meeting room, and you know what? Vint couldn't get it to work on his laptop. So this was really embarrassing to him, and it's like it wasn't until the end of the meeting he came up to him and says, hey, was the Wi-Fi working? Because I couldn't get it to work. And we're saying, yeah, Vin, no problem. Okay. So if Vince Surf couldn't get the stuff to work, think about it. You know, <laughs> this stuff is not ready for prime time yet. Okay. So we've got to look around for the magicians. And if you look at this crap amateur radio service, it's been around for 100 years. And um, it has a lot of spectrum allocated to it. As long as hams don't use the spectrum for commercial purposes, they can do anything. Um, we have sort of uh, rules of the road we developed over those hundred years. We treat it as a common, so no ham has any right to use any spectrum over anybody else. So we have to cooperate. We have a minimum power rule, so the rule is use the minimum amount of power necessary to establish communications. It's self-policing, self-certifying of equipment, so I can build any equipment and put it in service without asking the government for permission. Uh, the other thing is sort of a U.S. thing, which I'll just pass over. But look at all this spectrum, and this is just a small slice of it that's available to the amateur radio service in the United States. And similar allocations are available here in the U.K. <coughs> so one of the things that's happened in the States, and actually here, is that amateur radio has helped the regulatory bodies make some of their decisions, and that uh, HAMS has done a lot of research and spread spectrum. So after the commission made its initial um, availability of spread spectrum in 1985, there was a lot of work uh, done by the amateur radio service in the states to improve it. So this just outlines some of the research which I won't get into, but basically uh, the federal government in the U.S. tried to, um, in 1981, um, in, in, uh, put in place a spectrum paradigm shift where they basically advocated, they put out a rulemaking to allow spectrum to be used from DC to daylight, you know, from the bottom of the spectrum to the top with no power limits and overlaying existing services. This isn't very well known, even in the commission today, because governments in some cases have very lousy institutional memories when they don't want to remember something. Okay. So, um, but our government did do this back then. So think about it. 
spread spectrum everywhere, no power limits, overlaying television, land mobile radio. That was a proposal. Well, what happened is all that got beat back, and I'll just pass over this, um, in that, um, uh, I'll, I'll touch that in a bit, but basically what the HAMS did is they did a lot of research and showed that what the government was trying to do could work because the HAMS did it. So my point here is that existence proofs always help, and you should endeavor to try to show that something can happen rather than talking about something happening. And that means certain people that have the gumption and the wherewithal or whatever to do that go out and do those sorts of things. <coughs> Very important, okay? Because if you want to hack the regulatory system, it's deeds, not words, that will ultimately prevail. So, what I want to show here is that when Wi-Fi came out, okay, with these little cards and stuff that are priced at uh, consumer prices, you guys all became hams, okay? Right? You have spectrum that you're sharing. Um, there are rules. There are a minimal amount of rules, okay? To make these devices work, you have to cooperate, right? Okay? Just like we hands sit, all right? So you're hams now. So you're facing the same kind of problems that we've been dealing with for 100 years. So you've caught up to us, okay? So don't you think that we have a lot of knowledge that we might want to share to help you guys come into this new world, to become magicians in your own right? Hey, you know? So, let's look at property model problems. <laughs> the way the spectrum is um, set up, the physics of it, um, there's what we call the prime beachfront property spectrum. And this goes from like 30 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. Everybody wants to be there has a number of interesting properties, that spectrum. And uh, as it turns out, all of that got pretty much allocated by the end of the 1970s. So at the time, the chairman of the FCC was saying, hey, it's all gone. What are we going to do? Which is why they embarked on that spread spectrum thing that I mentioned earlier. Okay? So um, if they could use spread spectrum, which was the military was using very successfully, i.e., the military uses covert, unjammable, undetectable systems, right? So the idea was if, that we could get the commercial sector to adopt these technologies which had been declassified during the 70s, then the commission would have a new spectrum management tool and that now you could have all these devices sort of sitting in the same parts of the spectrum just sort of coexisting, okay? Just like the military systems. Albeit there would be a lot more of these systems, but you know, uh, the commission did the, 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 the work, the science, they had the science in hand before they proposed this to the commissioners, smart idea, to show that this was all going to work. But it failed. In that between 1981 and 1985, when the spread spectrum rules finally were released, what you saw was the rules that you know about today, which are these three little bands, 900 megahertz, not here, but 2.4 and 5 gig, okay, and one watt of power limitation, okay? Because what happened was, think about it, in the early 80s we were in the midst of the Cold War. So the idea of the general populace running around with undetectable, unjammable <laughs> communications devices was chilling to certain parts of the government. Okay? So they were against it. The, um, some of the commercial companies, like Motorola, were against it because their monopoly in land mobile radio would be, and public safety radio would be, Touched. And finally, the National Association of Broadcasters, because think about it, we could overlay the television channels, which was their property. So a lot of forces aligned themselves to fight this, and unfortunately, the science was trumped by politics. And so what's happened is that we've lost 20 years of this innovation, not only in the United States, but all around the world. And it was a sad day. But, but, look at what has happened because of that spread spectrum rules in 85. The opposition thought they killed it, but now look at why fine. Who would have thought that with one Y and those three little bands you could do what you could have done today? You see? So that's how unintended consequences work. So let's look at what we call in the states the unlicensed national information infrastructure ban. That's a 
That's the five gig band. That's a real mouthful, and there's political reasons why it's called that. But think about it. The unlicensed national information infrastructure band. Okay? This band was supposed to be used for community networking. Okay? Grassroots community networking. And 300 megahertz of spectrum was allocated to it. And at the time, cellular only had 200. 300 free non-auction you know, megahertz. Think about it. Now, I got to tell you, I was involved in the political battle for this, and it was like five years of blood on the floor, okay, to get this. All right, but we prevailed. It was uh, essentially Apple Computer took point on this and spent lots of money, so they deserve a lot of credit for this <coughs> that uh, they don't get today because nobody knows about the five-year blood on the floor battle. But the original proposal was for community networking, talk about point, multi-point ranges of two to six miles and point-to-point -point ranges of 15 miles. That was the original proposal. Now, if you look at today, another 255 megahertz of spectrum was just allocated, both here and in the US. Uh, there's low-cost equipment available. The ranges of these devices have gone up from point-to-multi-point up to 12 miles. In some cases, I've seen 15, OK? So double what was originally proposed. And then point-to-point -point ranges up to 60 miles, 60 miles. Again, unintended consequences. So, now, let me talk about what we're going to do in California, the Gigabit of Bus Initiative, briefly. Um, you probably can't see all this, but uh, the organization in the state that's running this thing is called CNIC, which is Corp Corporation for Educational Networking Initiatives in California. CNIC runs the... Um, educational broadband networks in the state. Okay, so it gets state funding to do this, and it also just got passed by the federal government to construct something called the National Lambda Rail, which is a five-year, $100 million effort to build a transcontinental 40 gigabit uh, network, which will not replace, but supplement Internet 2, which is a paraboline, which is a 10 gigabit network. So Scenic has a lot on its plate. And the goal of the initiative is to deliver one gigabit pipes to everybody in the state that's home and businesses by 2010. And uh, also wireless, so that means we're technology neutral, so if we're gonna use, there's fiber, we'll use it. If there's cable, we'll use it, whatever. We'll also use wireless. I'm in charge of a wireless task force. So my mandate from the initiative is to figure out how you, when you walk out the front door you can sip a gigabit. I want to emphasize here that the gigabit is not so much a data rate, it's sort of a, it's, a, it's about capabilities, it's about delivering capacity to do new kinds of applications. So don't get hung up on the gigabit. When we say we're going to deliver a gigabit, we really mean it, okay, in that time frame. But it, it's a lot more expansive how we're treating this definition than just the, the speed. A lot of people get hung up on the speed thing. We have a four-phase plan, and we're in phase three right now. So I'll just review those briefly. Um, we awarded a grant by the state. We launched the uh, On the Road to a Gigabit Awards. The idea being here is that, as every year, we need to show that we're making progress toward this gigabit goal in 2010. So we're doing this by actually deploying real pilot projects. Again, deeds, not words. And the best way to do that is give awards to get people motivated. So we also commissioned the Gardner Group to do a study, which you can find on our website, which is at scenic.org, you know, C-E-N-I-C.org. Um, the One Giga Bus Initiative, a broadband vision for California. So um, I want to show my company won the award last year for innovation. And I just want to, I got the five minute bell, but what I want to show you is the difference in the technologies in that we won the award for working with a utility company that delivers power and water in Northern California. We got them to, to turn off their licensed microwave network and replace it with unlicensed radio. Okay, so think about this. A power company, critical infrastructure, going from licensed microwave to unlicensed. Big paradigm shift. All right? So I want to show you the difference. So those dishes, that's a sort of a 10-foot dish. Uh, that's the old microwave technology, and then the, what's replacing it above there is a, micro, uh, is a new uniband device from Motorola called Canopy. 
<laughs> look at that. Look at the signs. And this is like, uh, that device is uh, four times the speed of the original microwave system. And it costs, ha, huh. um, they basically, to upgrade their microwave system, it's going to cost them over $2 million, but in Canada it costs 75000 Okay, so that's the difference in the economics. Here's another shot. You get a better view of the difference in the size of the technology. You can barely see the canopy you know, against that. Over the same path. That's a 35-mile path that's going over. So let me just talk about that. We're in the third phase of, of the thing. We're basically, this is the year we get action plans, figure out how we're going to pay for this thing. And the final year, five years, is to implement it. Okay, cue the audio. I want to show you a sort of short video here that sort of represents um, the problems that we have and you have in terms of uh, doing paradigm shifts. Okay, it's called cat herding. This man right here is my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle, holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs. Well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's really? just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, yet. you hear the stories, it's... I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost to one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. EDS, managing the complexities of e-business. Okay, so, yeah, I, that was a, that was done by EDS for a Super Bowl a few years ago, and I, it speaks for itself. What can I say? Look, what wireless needs is, in case you guys forgot, last year was in December was the 100th anniversary of the Wright Brothers' first flight. What wireless needs is the first flight, okay? To get it out of this property regimen into this new commons world and uh, beyond. So what we need to get into the air is to try to recapture the bold thinking that uh, the federal government in the U.S. Um, tried in 81 and got beat back. We need to move to a new model of spectrum allocation and management, what some of us call open spectrum. And we need to develop and deploy something called cognitive radios. Now, cognitive radios, just to briefly state, are radios that are, well, they're heuristic. They're this artificial intelligence through that term, but think about it. I talked about radio being magic, wireless being magic, but like, here is where um, magic is truly being deployed as opposed to other fields, okay? Cognitive radios. And so there's a rulemaking out that came out in December from the FCC on cognitive radios. And what a cognitive radio is, you may have heard the term smart radio. A smart radio is a radio that works algorithmically and is deterministic, okay? Its behavior is deterministic. And a cognitive radio works on heuristics, which are goal-seeking. And so it's non-deterministic. So the idea in this rulemaking is to turn the regulatory authority of the commission over to the device itself, to decentralize that authority into the device. So this is going to bring in a whole new world. And as you can imagine, how do, you, how do the regulators deal with non-determinism? Okay. Well, uh, to give the credit to the FCC, they're trying to make that stretch. It's going to be a tough battle, a very tough battle, to get this across because the incumbents have drawn the line. Okay. Um, it's going to be thermonuclear war akin to that, okay, because um, that's what's at stake. But the goal here is to get fast bits anywhere, anytime, and that's the enabler, and that will allow us to, to who knows. But again, think about what happened in 85 and that, those simple rules and what it's resulted in today. So we can't afford to lose another 20 years. Thank you very much.